clear now. You see, so now it's really becoming clear why Russia would ally with the Arab states that are listed in the Tinbite Hizkiel prophecy. Now, Russia's dependence on Arab oil fields is obvious. It's obvious in her subversive activities. Russia, U USSR included in this overall, you understand summary of Russia, but we're looking at as it's emerging today, Russia's subversive activities have existed in countries like Turkey, countries like Persia, which is known as ancient or modern Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya are well, well, well documented. So everyone is looking at this present Libyan crisis and saying, well, it's America. America is doing this. America is doing that. And nobody, but nobody is mentioning Russia. Here's what we found to be kind of very interesting, actually. We were watching some of the videos, you know, of the so-called uh, people on the ground in Libya, the Benghazi, um, so-called rebels versus uh, Gaddafi loyalists and supporters and all of that. And some of the people did seem Russian. I mean, I'm just going to put that out there. Some of the people that was mingled, because you have to remember what happened to the Russians when they were in Afghanistan with the whole Taliban incident. Some of the Russian soldiers actually converted to Islam. And I remember my earthly father when he was when he was in this world, you understand, when he was alive um, in this world, that he had mentioned that, you understand? And that seemed to have made a great uh, significance to him that he was reading through the news and that the war was turning against Russia's effort to um, take over Afghanistan back in the day, you understand, um, with the whole Taliban thing and the Mujahideen, but that a lot of the Russians who were captured, the Russian soldiers who were captured, the, uh, the Russian soldiers, they had become uh, Muslim. You understand? So there's a very interesting little overlap and link, you understand, both of ethnicity as well as religion. And when the two go together or when the two go opposite, these are um, what you call uh, certain variables. You have, we have to understand how some of these variables come into play you understand, with each other and see what prophecy is stating so that when these variables are in the same play as what prophecy, then we can recognize exactly that we've hit it, we've hit it right on the hour. So we, we know it's like it's like Big Ben, you understand, Big Benya, Benjamin, you know, that the, the bell is sounding every hour on the hour. So when you have a direct hit, you understand, and a kind of a time change. We're out of that particular hour, and we're into a new hour. So Russia has a dependence on Arab oil fields, obviously, but Russia also has been involved in subversive activities in Turkey, Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya, and all this is well documented, but nobody is looking to see, well, at least publicly in the media, what what involvement does Russia have in this Libya situation today since it's lining up very accurately with prophecy? However, until lately, the nations, the Mengistat, you understand, listed in this prophecy were were relatively friendly to the West and to Israel. You understand? So when you, we look over history, there's a time when the these many of these nations, you understand, were at a time on friendly terms to the West and to Israel. So think about ones looking at prophecy over various centuries before. At certain times, it, it, it didn't seem like this was very, very near and that prophecy in the end times was, was far off. But we can see now that recent like political revolutions and social upheavals, you understand, are changing the whole Middle East just as it had driven, you understand, each one further into the communist orbit. We see now that these kind of social revolutions, social media revolutions are also now, since communism is on this, the back burner, so to speak, you understand, that now we have terrorism, Islamic fundamentalism, that, that now might be another avenue you understand, of Russia and Arab connection 
when we understand some of the history. Now, if the dispensationalists are right, the ones who look at everything to be certain dispensation in a certain dispensation of things, then future prospects would seem to indicate the future prospects, the worsening of relations between these states and the West and further antagonism toward Israel. And an Iranian victory, probably with Russian assistance over Iraq, which is unnamed in the prophecy. And this is what's interesting, is that um, both that Iraq is unnamed in the prophecy and that when this particular article by Ed uh, Hinson, um, Libya, a part of Ezekiel's prophecy, was written, it was 1986. And we're reading it today in the context of 2011, March 20 of 2011, Purim, and since the eve of Purim, the, the Shabbat Zakor, you understand, when the West decided to bomb Libya. So this article, Libya, a part of Ezekiel's prophecy, comes full circle. So some of the continued hostilities now, you understand, between the U.S. and Libya and the West is once again front and center in the news and in the, the, the current events. What must be taken seriously is the alignment, the political alignments. You understand the economic and the political and even certain religious alignment of the nations in Ezekiel's prophecy. The designation Libya, in the Hebrew we find punt, put, foot or put, right, foot usually. And it appears five times in the Bible, in Ezekiel chapter 30 verse 5 and Jeremiah chapter 46 verse 9. Libya is listed with Egypt and Ethiopia as one of the nations that will soon be defeated by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, by Nebuchadnezzar, Nebu, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 43, the Libyans and the Ethiopians are mentioned in connection with one who is called the willful, the willful king, according to Daniel. 11 verses 36 to 45, who is generally and has been generally taken to be the Antichrist. Generally taken to be the Antichrist. Now, it is very, very interesting because now we have our first so called black president or African American president in uh, Barack Hussein Obama. And many have already, you know, been speculating and, 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 and debating and speculating on whether Obama is the Antichrist, you understand, or not. Some say yes and some say absolutely not. So, you know, you have these two views of it. But that, that portion of study, you understand, to study and, and, and do some diligence on that is also very interesting. And hopefully we may have a, a time to, to touch on that particular point. But... In summary, Daniel 11 and 43, the Libyans, Ethiopians are mentioned in connection with the willful king of uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 to 45, who is generally taken to be the Christos Tekawami, or the Antichrist. Now, finally, in Acts, Acts of the Apostles, yeah, Hawariyat Serah, chapter 2, verse 10, it says that the, quote, parts of Libya about serene parts of Libya about serene. That's the quote in Acts of the Apostle, chapter 2, verse 10, is listed as one of the places from which the Jews or the true Hebrews, the Ethiopian Hebrews or the black Jews and the prostatites had come to Jerusalem, come to Jerusalem for the feast of Pentecost, the, the, the feast of Pentecost, or the harvest festival, and and miraculously heard their own language being spoken by the Hawariyat, by the apostles. Now the Aris Kidan, the New Testament, also refers to the man who carried 
Jesus's meskel, who carried Christ's cross or Jesus's cross as being Simon of Serene, according to Matthew chapter 27, verse 32. Now, there's a there's a very interesting um, Judeo-Christian perspective to this, this link, as well as there's a racial link, you understand, even to Simon, who's called the nigger. Simon is the only one in the Bible, the first one and the only one in the Bible to use that byword that has become a byword for the lost sheep in the Americas and the Caribbean. And that byword is the N word. And the N word is the word nigger, Negro from Negro. We have nigger in the old times and by the races. And then we have nigger, nigger, where, where the lost sheep play with the word and try to reinvent the word. Now, Prior to the rise of Islam, in the 7th century AD, there were flourishing churches in Roman North Africa. Now, notice how North Africa is always being put under, under either the Europeans or the, or the Mohammedans, the Arabs. You understand? But it was taken from the Africans or from the Ethiopians. It's a sign of Ethiopia's or, or ancient black people's defeat. You understand? It's a very clear sign. But what's a, even a more interesting sign is that prior, prior to the rise of Islam in the 7th century A.D., we're talking about like 700 AD, right? 700 of this common so-called time, there were flourishing churches. There were flourishing, not just churches, not just communities, but flourishing, growing, flourishing. You understand? Churches in Roman North Africa and, and, and East Africa, but particularly in what today is Libya. That might be very, very hard for some to, to believe or to accept as true. But prior to the rise of Islam in the 7th century A.D., there were flourishing churches. And, and make a note of this. These churches were churches where black people or the black Jews, the so-called Ethiopian Hebrews, were very prominent. African Christians, black African Christians were very prominent. But with the rise of Islam in the 7th century, gone are those churches, those Christian churches in Roman Africa, and also gone are the black Jews, the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew presence, the true Hebrew presence in North Africa, particularly in Libya. And why we have gone on the record to say that we do not support Muammar Gaddafi. We don't support Gaddafi. You understand? Know One of the reasons why is because he showed a very important sign, what he did with the flag, by taking down the red, black, and green. Now, we know over here what the red, black, and green symbolizes over here in the Americas. It symbolizes black power. Do you want to know why many of those people, even in Libya, and why those colors have such a resonance with them? You understand? It's because of the impact that an ancient form of nigger Hebrew Jewish culture made on those people, and even Islamic culture, which was, was in the form and image of niggers, black people. But see, we ended up far, far off in the West from our land, and we were sold by many of the ancestors of who those people over in the Middle East now now they want the same freedoms and they want to emulate once again even us and the example in the West. So this should be very clear to really decipher because identity, identity, identity. Identity is very important to being able to um, interpret accurately this prophecy, especially in connection with the events of the time. You understand? Because see, the prophecy is an active prophecy. The, the prophecy gives us, gives us various clues, indications. Um, it instructs us, you understand, about certain even, even if we are in the, in the position, you understand, to counsel or advise rulers, the, the advice that, that, that good biblical hermeneutic can do for rulers, you understand, and those who have charge over peoples or nations is, is, is vital is vital. 
So identity, identity, identity. Identity is everything. In other words, being able to identify who is being spoken of in the scriptures at what particular time, how things have changed from that time, what particular stages things have gone through. I mean, this the final point in, in this section right here is just that prior to the rise of Islam in the 7th century AD, they were flourishing churches and what we note flourishing black african hebrew judeo-christian churches in roman north africa in what today is known as libya so the question obviously must be will they succeed will will this invasion that many are once again revisiting Ezekiel's prophecies, especially chapters 38 and 39 concerning Gog and Magog. The question is, and a, a very good question, is will they succeed? Will the enemies of the Beta Israel, will the enemies, you understand, succeed? Will they succeed? The ultimate questions in the current crisis and current crises that we are witnessing presently, as they were when this article was originally um, um, published in 1986, are where is it headed? Where is it headed? And will the Russian Arab invasion be successful? Now, some add to this the dimension of Shina, China. China also must be figured figured in this and cannot be left out of this. China has a very important role, much more so now, you know, saying in 2011, than she did, say, in 1986 when Ed Hinson, professor of religion and biblical studies at Liberty University, Lynchburg, Virginia, you understand, wrote this article, Libya, a part of Ezekiel prophecy. Tinbete Hizkia, it indicates that the current crisis and crises will and must eventually escalate. They must and will eventually escalate into a wider confrontation and other fronts of the confrontation in unexpected and seemingly unlikely places will also, will also develop, Yovazen, and burst out. Not exactly when that will happen is not clearly stated. And, and, and there's some important reasons in the prophecy why, and in prophecy in general, but why time? People always want to know, well, when is it going to happen? Today, tomorrow? Because they want to put it on TiVo or put it on their schedule. It doesn't happen like that. You understand? And, and the technology that we have and, and the modern society that we have, it has, it has deranged us you understand, out of, out of a, a, a true grounded, we're not grounded anymore, you understand, most, most of us don't even see or are not able to see even the signs of the heavens, which are very, very important prophetically as well. You see, the signs in the heavens are very, very important. I mean, I've always asked the question, I said, why would these, um, these people spend billions of dollars on, on telescopes and all kind of observatories and everything like that, just to look at stars. But see, what a lot of the the the, the unlearned people, the people who haven't really been been initiated or or the eyes that, who are blind, deaf, and dumb don't really recognize it. They just spend this money for sat satellites and telescopes just to look at stars. But it's also connected with prophecy. It's also connected with unraveling biblical and scriptural and scriptural events you understand this is why the so-called rulers rule and the ruled have been ruled for so long you understand so exactly when that will happen exactly when this wider confrontation the key word here is confrontation it reminds me of the Burhana Selassie the Bob Marley album cover that really really describes the, the the fulfillment of it where we're where we're headed if one's want to know well where are we headed you understand? And 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 will will the 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 invasion, you understand, of Israel. And when we say Israel, Ethiopia, 
it must be it must be understood that Ethiopia, even modern Ethiopia, is a part of this equation in two ways, in two ways because Ethiopia uh, represents the, the 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 medium in a sense between the East and the Western world. The, the emperor of Ethiopia, you understand that the emperor of Ethiopia was this this um balance it was like the balance but like also a door you understand like a door between the east and the west between the asian world the african world on one hand between islam on one hand and christianity on the next hand you understand know so ethiopia in the prophecy should be understood in, in, in two ways. See, there's Ethiopia in the time of Hiskiel, which represented the Sudan dimension and linked with the Sudan, Eritrea, and Somalia, you understand, who are also linked with Gaddafi, who are linked with Gaddafi in Libya. But then there's another element of Ethiopia too, which is Judeo-Christian. You understand, Judeo-Christian, that means they link in in spirit and in truth with the the true Jews with the true Beta Israel so there's a there's almost like a split screen concerning Ethiopia see well, so when people look at the prophecy and say well oh Ethiopia is is down with it as well what they failed to really understand was Ethiopia what was known as Kush or Ethiopia in the time of Nebiu Hizkiel, according to Tinbete Hizkiel. So all of this indicates that the current crisis will escalate. Eventually then, but we see a, an increasing escalation at the current time. Exactly when it will happen was not clearly stated. But we see in our present time, a rapid ramping up and escalation. You always send news events that used to take perhaps um, in the old news cycle, it could take a week or weeks for things to happen. Now these things are happening in, in days, sometime in a day. Sometime in the morning, we check out one news in the morning. You always send, then in the evening, we go check it out. Everything has been turned 180 degrees. Yo, it was an opposite of what we heard or what was the case early in the morning. So pronosticators would do well to exercise caution. You understand pronosticators and false predictors, you understand, which are basing it on faulty or really unvetted and unweighed and balanced, uh, uncertain information or uncertain predictions or feelings. You understand, so pronosticators, caution should be exercised. It is not yet clear that the current situation, you understand, is directly related to Ezekiel's prophecy. Other steps have to happen. This may be only a preliminary step, what we're witnessing right now in Libya. You understand, it may be a preliminary step in order to set the stage for the actual fulfillment at a later time. You understand, so there's other things that still are hinging in the balance, you know, there's other Arab countries that are going through uh, revolt and and protests and and the killing of 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 of, of, of democratic um, and people who want democracy, uh, democratic protesters, and so forth and so on, all throughout that particular region, you know, saying? and in some of the countries, some of the countries are allied actually, you know, saying? with the West or are on friendly terms like Saudi. Like Saudi Arabia is a, is, a, is a and Bahrain a very interesting, you know, is a, is a very interesting uh, case in a case in, in in point. But as to whether uh, the the Russian and the Arab invasion will be successful, the Bible emphatically basically says no. You see, Jah's promise, God's promise, is clearly recorded it's clearly recorded in the very beginning in the very beginning of this prophetic area of scripture ezekiel chapter chapter 38 it's recorded in verse in in, in verse um three and it's it's it's, it's clear it says in the whole look and see in a 
I am against thee. I am against thee. So the Almighty is against thee. He's against their, their attempts to blot out the name of the Beta Israel. Even in verse 4, it says, I will turn thee back in verse 4. And in verse 8, it says, My fury shall come up in my face. Then we have verse 22. It says, I will rain upon him fire and brimstone in verse 22. In verse 2 of the next chapter, chapter 39, it says, I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee. So that means that means five sixths are going to be destroyed. Then it says in, in, in verse 4, it says, Thou shall fall. Thou shall fall. So this confederacy is bound, is doomed to fall. And it goes on to say, it goes on to say in verse uh, 6, I will send fire upon Magog, which is the actually the land of that prince Gog. That prophecy is certain. It's emphasized by the words that we find in Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 8. Behold, look and see. In the whole, it is come and it is done. It is come. And it is done, saith Egeziahir, saith Yahweh, saith the sustainer Jah, Rastafari. It is done. The aftermath now of the battle is such, according to prophecy, that it will take, it says, seven years to burn all the rubble of battle. It will take about seven years to burn all of this. Now, this is also very key because the first thing I'm thinking about now, I'm saying, well, the, a lot of this, a lot of this uh, rubble must be radiated in some ways. You understand with the current radiation back front and center in the news. And it says it takes seven months, seven months to bury the dead. That shouldn't be so really shocking when we see how some of these devastations can be. But this battle is unlike any other battle. Now, in the end, the true Beta Israel will turn to Elohim. Just as it says in Psalm 68, verse 31, it says, It just said that princes shall come out of Egypt, Ethiopia, Yovzen, and covenant Ethiopia, Yovzen represents the authority, covenant Ethiopia, and pure Ethiopia represents the authority of the true Beta Israel of the true Beit Israel. So in the Bemacharishan, you understand, in the end, you understand, Israel will turn to God. In the end, the true Ethiopia, Ethiopia will return to the King of Kings and he will pour out his spirit. He will pour out his spirit upon them according to Ezekiel 39 and 29. So this is very, very interesting. And there's much more to be said about it, but here we will pause and touch on Armageddon because Armageddon, it needs to be understood, is connected with this. You see, there, there are two battles, and these two battles are often confused one for another or some even put them both as the same battle. There is the invasion, which is spoken of in Ezekiel, and then in Revelation, there is the Har-Mageddon, the Har-Mageddon. So the question was asked, is Armageddon soon? Is Armageddon soon? Now, according to Rastafari Revelation, we have a little, uh, a slightly different interpretation, which we can vet and back up with Scripture, but it would probably take uh, some time, just a little bit of time for us to go through it, but when we look at Armageddon, you understand, we see the fascist invasion of Ethiopia, of Imperial Ethiopia, during the time of Moa An Bessazem Negeri Yehuda, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah. But now the Armageddon they're speaking of, they're speaking about the final conflict, this final conflict between Ha Mushi, 
the Messiah and the forces of Christos Tekawami, Antichrist, culminating at the end of what is known as a tribulation period, or Jacob's trouble, some, some interpret, in the valley, in the valley that's known as Har Megiddon. Har Megiddon. Now, the scriptures for the Har Megiddon battle are Revelation chapter 16, verses 16 to 21, Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 21, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 15. Now, by contrast, when we contrast it now with um, the Tinbete Hizkiel and Ezekiel's eschatological battle, there's an eschatological battle is located in the valley of, of the passengers when we look at Ezekiel chapter 39 verse 11 it's called the valley of the passengers or the those who pass by also it's called the valley of Jehoshaphat the valley of e Jehoshaphat or Josephat ja Yahweh Shaphat in other words exiabi referred fit Egeziabi here, and it was the judgment of the sustainer, Yahweh. In other words, these appear to be totally different conflicts. They are fought at different times. We can even say in different ways, in different locations, and by, and this is the key thing, they're fought by different participants. So when Ones will say you hear people, ignorant Christians, Christians who claim to be Christian, but they're really ignorant. They're not studying to show themselves approved to God as workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. They cannot rightly divide the word of truth. Therefore, they need to be ashamed to call themselves a Christian and be asking, is Armageddon coming soon? And not really recognizing, you understand, the connection. You understand of Imperial Ethiopia in the person of Moa and Bessas M Negeta Yehuda Kadamawi Hala Salasi Suyumek Ziab Nugus Negeza Chopia, the king of kings of Ethiopia, what occurred in World War II, and now what we're witnessing, you understand, in the progression of prophecy. So the Ezekiel eschatological battle or invasion of Israel, the Gog and Magog um situation, you understand battle, you understand, occurs in a different place, you understand, it's a different conflict, it occurs at a different time, you understand, a different location, and the key thing, it has different participants. So Ezekiel's prophecy needs to be distinguished, you understand, from Armageddon. And a lot of your, if your pastors and your preachers are mixing, mixing these two battles up, they are not doing due diligence, and, and you're not really getting good food. You're not really being properly fed. You're being spiritually malnourished. You understand? Spiritually malnourished. So what you need to do, you understand, is to come out of Babylon, that confusion. If they're confusing these two battles, then your preacher or pastor hasn't rightly divided the word of truth, hasn't studied to show yourself approved as a workman of God, doing God's work, holding the Bible or teaching and ministering from the Bible. You understand? And there's no excuse for it, especially in the time that we live where where information goes at at, at, at a click of a finger, you understand, goes at clicks, you understand, and you can get, get a lot of information that it would have taken people more than lifetimes, several lifetimes, to even have access to where all the information was stored and hidden and, and so forth and so on. But what must be taken seriously by every student of biblical prophecy, especially by the Dek of Mezamorit, by the disciples, of the King of Kings and his Christ is the alignment of the nations, the alignment of the nations in Ezekiel's prophecy or the Tinbete Hizkiel, which is now a reality, which is now a reality. If we are not seeing, if I and I am not seeing the first stages of prophetic fulfillment, then we are certainly closer than when we, than we were before and we're closer than 1986 when this article was originally written now secondly we must all face the fact even though his imperial majesty um 
was able to, uh, as it says in, in prophecy, to, to in a sense, um, bias the space of time. You understand, especially as a lost sheep, as the Beta Israel. You understand the space of time. You understand to um, like that 40 years in the wilderness, similar to the Israelites, the 40 years in the wilderness where there was a whole generation, a generation change concerning the issues of uh, universal nuclear uh, destruction. But we must all face the fact that universal nuclear destruction is an imminent uh, possibility and the way the earth crisis and earth runnings is, is manifesting is becoming more and more of a probability. To put it more bluntly, WTF, how much closer to the end can we get before we get to the end? How much close to the edge can we get before, in a sense, we go over, we go over the edge? All that has happened in such rapid succession regarding the crisis with Libya, especially the current crisis with Libya, it should remind us that God is still in control of the destiny of this world, the destiny of this planet, and certainly this is a time for concern, but not for panic, never for panic. It's a, it's a, it's a time for study. It's a time for prayer. You understand? It's a time for serious remembrance and thought. It is also a time for serious study. We cannot glibly, you know, just sit back and assume everything will be fine because prophecy never allows us that option. In fact, prophecy really tells us the opposite. The tin beat tells us the opposite. The tin beat tells us that we can't sit back. The, the, the tin beat says do, don't assume because the, as, as the old so-called joke, but a joke is on you if you assume you make an ass out of yourself.